On behalf of the GNCC board, welcome to our first ever hackathon organized by our WIN Council. Events over the past 50 months have highlighted inequities faced by people from across Canada. Women especially have been disproportionately negatively impacted by the pandemic, more specifically racialized Black and Indigenous women, ones with disabilities and those living in rural communities. GNCC's vision is to see Naga not only at its economic, but also at its social best. And so we are so thrilled to be working with our internal advisory councils and especially the WIND Council during these critical times as we are collectively redefining our path forward. It is my great honor to introduce the chair of WIND Council, Julie Rorson, who's also the president of the YWCA Naga board and the founder of the Naga Leadership Summit for Women. Julie, over to you. Thanks, Mishka. I appreciate the very kind introduction. And welcome to all of our guests here today. Thank you for joining us. I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. The land where I'm coming from today is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe people who have lived and tended these lands for millennia, and many continue to live and work here today. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and the Dish with One Spoon Wampum. And today, this gathering place we call Niagara is home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people who share the land and resources with us. By reflecting on the heritage of the land we share, we are reminded that our great standard of living is directly related to the resources and friendship of indigenous people over many generations. We also know that this land acknowledgement is a statement. It is not a solution to generations of trauma and damaged relations, and that we as settlers and people of white privilege are responsible for taking action to support equity for indigenous people. Over the last few weeks, many of us have learned the truth about the residential school system in Canada, many of us for the first time. And we've been learning about the legacy of trauma that it has left Indigenous families, including families right here in our community. The school children from Kamloops remind us of our responsibilities under the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And for many of us, provide a reality check about our current state of affairs. And to build back better, we have to think about intersectionality, about layers of identity and different experiences and design systems that work for everyone, including indigenous people, people of color, people of different faiths, religions, and experiences. This is one of the lenses that we bring to today's discussion. It is about building an inclusive economic recovery in Niagara, a new way forward that will benefit everyone. So, Let's get to it. Traditionally, we think about a hackathon as a technology-based uh, activity with computers and apps, but really it's the idea about people coming together to hack at problems and create solutions. And one of the biggest problems we are facing now is the disproportionate impact that the pandemic has had on women, and in particular, women of color and diverse ethnicities. We know this is a real thing and it is a very real problem from our own experiences, through the women in our lives, our families, and conversations we have at work and around the table. This truth is also verified in the data. We also know there are many different reasons for this problem, from lack of childcare, family responsibilities, layoffs, the shutdown of entire sectors that are dominated by women, especially here in Niagara. And of course, there's the historical inequities that compound this crisis and on and on it goes. And while I do wanna say that I think it's a big step forward to be discussing feminist economic policy and hearing words like gender lens and social infrastructure in the news and in our public dialogue, we also wanna make sure that we seize this moment of opportunity for action, not just talk and get to solving this problem. So that's why we're here today, to begin moving from talk to action here in Niagara. At WIN Council, our purpose is to advise on issues that impact women in business and be a voice for women in Niagara. So we saw these policy papers and the research coming out and we thought, how can we get back to, how can we help get women back to work in Niagara? How can we support an inclusive entrepreneurship system here in our community? How can we support inclusive economic development, development that benefits everyone? How can we work together, collaborate and co-create with more women's groups, business groups in Niagara and Build Back Better. We saw that so much good work and research has already been done and now we have an opportunity to put a Niagara lens on it. So here we are today, a hackathon to get us thinking about some of the solutions and ways forward. 
At Wind Council, we also want to work with the community and broaden our networks for collaboration with more diverse voices and points of view. We know that Niagara looks very different than most of us, and we want to collaborate with like-minded folks to support women in Niagara and an equitable recovery that will benefit everyone. Because we know that we will not have a sustainable recovery without women's equal participation in the workforce, without women at work, without our contributions to civic life and business and entrepreneurship and pay equity. So you all know all of this and that's why you're here. So let's get to it. Let me give you a quick outline of what we're gonna do this afternoon. First, we're gonna take a look at the Ontario Chamber of Commerce Recovery Strategy to start thinking about ways that we can apply some ideas here in Niagara. Then we'll get some data about the local picture. And this will set us up for a discussion in small breakout rooms where we'll get focused on some solutions and ideas to move us forward. We really want to hear from you. This is just the start of the next phase action. So please get ready to get involved. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Claudia DeSanti, the Senior Manager of Policy at the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, where she founded and co-chairs several areas of policy research on energy and environment, housing, diversity and inclusion. And last year, Claudia authored the OCC's Recovery Strategy, which outlines five critical findings and recommendations for action for an equitable recovery from the pandemic. Welcome, Claudia, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much, Julie, for having me. Thank you, Mishka, and the whole team at Women in Niagara. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Uh, I'll share my screen and walk through a few slides just to set us up here. Um, so as Julie mentioned, I had the pleasure of authoring a report for the Ontario Chamber of Commerce last year called the Recovery Project. Um, and the term Recovery, as you probably can tell, refers to the economic recovery of women. At the Chamber, we see this as being not just a social and a moral issue, but very much a business issue because we know that women's participation in the workforce has tremendous economic benefits. Um, so as soon as the pandemic hit, we started to see an immediate impact on women in the workforce, and we decided to partner with Ontario Power Generation and the Women Entrepreneurship Knowledge Hub at Ryerson University. Um, and the outcome of that was this report, uh, which we uh, launched in September, and I'll share a few highlights as well as some progress that's been made since then. Starting with the impacts of COVID-19 on working women. Um, so back in March, job losses were about twice as high for women than men, uh, and I'll see, you'll see this represented visually on the next slide. Uh, at one point, women's participation in the workforce reached its lowest level in 30 years across Canada, and that's very different from the past recession that we saw in 2008-2009, when only about 18% of job losses in Canada were held by women. But it's an entirely different crisis this time. We also know that women entrepreneurs on average reported losing more contracts and customers due to COVID-19, and they were more likely to lay off staff and even close their doors permanently than male entrepreneurs. And the economic impacts have been most severe on average for groups of women that were already economically disadvantaged pre-pandemic, including low-income, racialized, indigenous, new immigrant, women with disabilities, and other groups. So here you can see on the next slide, um, the employment gap. This is for women ages 15 plus in Ontario. You can see that the gap was very wide over the summer. Uh, so from kind of June to October, it, uh, it started to narrow over the fall. Um, you'll see that once schools were reopening over the fall, that was great news for women. A lot of them were able to re-enter the labor market um, but then it started to widen again. And we don't know what the long-term impacts of this are. Uh, we won't know until the economy stabilizes, which won't happen for most regions until early next year, uh, according to most projections. But in any case, the impacts that we saw have revealed some very systemic differences between men and women in the workforce, um, which are worth paying attention to regardless of the long-term impacts, because uh, it's just, uh, it's hurting the productivity and incomes of our, uh, of our economy, as well as the social uh, outcomes more broadly. So before we look at the solutions that we propose, just wanna briefly cover some of the reasons we're seeing these uh, impacts. Julie touched on a few of these. The first reason has to do with the fact that women are so overrepresented in sectors that involve face-to-face -face contact. For example, food and accommodations, retail, social services. These are all industries that were most um, heavily impacted by restrictions that were put in place to curb the spread of the virus. Um, and these occupations also tend to pay less on average. 
Just to put this in perspective, women in Ontario account for only 7% of workers in the skilled trades, 20% in technology jobs, and 24% in natural and applied sciences. Very underrepresented in some sectors and over in others. Um, second, over the past 15 months, women have taken on a lot more of the additional childcare and homeschooling work that became necessary. And I should say it's not just childcare, but also elderly care, um, because many households took on uh, some elderly members uh, during the first wave as they pulled them out of long term care. And our data shows that it was mostly women taking on that additional care work. And the third explanation is specific to women entrepreneurs. Um, not only do they have an outside share of domestic work, but their businesses also tend to be structured differently than those of men. They tend to be smaller and less well financed. A lot of them found themselves ineligible for government supports in the early stages of the crisis, especially. Um, many are self-financed using personal assets uh, or debt that may not be appropriate to their needs. And they also tend to be concentrated again in those service sectors. And just to underscore the economic implications of all of this, you know, um, McKinsey has a study that shows that Canada's GDP could um, be increased by $150 billion annually if we increase women's participation in the workforce. Uh, RBC puts the number at $100 billion. So there's tons of evidence showing that there's a, a huge op op uh, economic opportunity cost here um, to the way things are. So in the report, we focused our recommendations on five big kind of buckets, uh, leadership and accountability, childcare, workforce development, entrepreneurship, and flexible work. These are all very interconnected and um, there are no small problems to solve, but I think part of the discussion today, you'll be able to chip away at some of these solutions. So first and foremost, leadership and accountability is about making sure that women are at the table, both within government and within companies, as they develop strategies around economic recovery um, and that steering committees, for example, are formed to tackle the very specific challenges um, that are part of this bigger problem. We were very pleased to see the federal and provincial governments both announce new inclusive economic recovery task force in their latest budgets. I think as a first step that signals that they're thinking about these issues, um, but that's just uh, sort of for now the infrastructure that you need to solve the problem, but it is an important first step. And we also know, as the cliche goes, that what gets measured gets done. And we heard this time and time again as we were consulting for this paper. Um, we really need to be working towards society-wide targets that track a variety of indicators over time, including employment gaps, but also women's representation in sectors that tend to be male dominant, uh, representation in leadership positions, the gender pay gap, hours spent on childcare, and a number of different outcomes. Um, and the emphasis here is on collective targets because the responsibility for these things isn't necessarily held by a specific group, it's shared across different stakeholders. And finally, procurement. Uh, this is a really incredible tool that government has as its disposal. Um, it's the largest purchaser in the economy. So in order to support and reward inclusive and women-owned businesses, the government can use its purchase power um, to reward the types of businesses that it, uh, it is looking to support during economic recovery. So the city of Toronto has a good supplier diversity program. Um, the federal government is also working towards developing its own. Uh, we've been urging the provincial government to do something similar and the NDP proposed a private member's bill on supplier diversity a couple months ago, but unfortunately it was voted down. So this is the kind of thing where we see a lot of opportunity for progress. The next bucket is childcare, um, and it's really difficult to overstate how important this is um, to, to the broader picture. The pandemic created some very specific challenges around childcare centers and schools, but the bigger issue is that childcare is unaffordable and or inaccessible for too many families in Ontario. It's also very difficult for families that don't work nine to five to find childcare arrangements that meet their schedule. Um, so most of you are likely aware that the federal government made some historic announcements and investments around childcare in its 2021 budget. Um, but the challenge is how you structure that going forward because childcare is within the jurisdiction of the provinces. And within provinces, people have very different philosophies about how childcare should be funded and structured. Um, so our report doesn't you know, recommend a specific answer or formula to that question that's going to have to come from consultation with families and childcare experts. But we do outline a few principles that should guide the reforms. 
The first is increased investment. There's just a lack of investment in childcare in Canada when you compare it to other OECD countries we're simply far, falling behind. Um, the second is to preserve choice. So it is very important um, in the conversations that I've had for a lot of families to have an option between the type of care that they receive. Um, the third is to subsidize both parents and providers. Right now, the system focuses, especially in Ontario, very heavily on subsidizing parents, the demand side, and less so on subsidies for providers, uh, the supply side. And fourth, prioritizing equity. So there are certain um, parents and families that need more support than others uh, in certain regions that have less access to childcare. So we need to think about uh, strategically investing in those uh, gaps. And, um, you know, the solution that we, we look at, part of it uh, relies heavily on addressing the shortage of qualified early childhood educators. Uh, so a few ways we can do this, uh, standardizing the certification criteria, fast tracking training programs, and providing training incentives for future graduates. A lot of people are looking to transition their careers or reskill after the pandemic. So there's an opportunity there to um, increase the supply of ECE workers. And finally, we explore some creative solutions, including the idea of incentivizing employers to offer childcare on site at their employment location. That is very rare in Canada right now, partly because it's very expensive to offer childcare directly, but it could be a great solution for larger employers um, or a collection of smaller employers that are located near, enough, near one another, excuse me. Um, and that would also take some pressure off of the community-based childcare spot. And then third, we have workforce development. Um, so our economy is evolving very quickly, largely because of technology adoption. And we know that there will be a need for continuous reskilling and upskilling of the workforce. The pandemic has, of course, accelerated a lot of that transition. And there are a lot of people that need immediate support with reskilling, um, especially given the impacts uh, disproportionately on particular groups of women. It's important that the reskilling programs that are available are targeted and accessible to the people who need it the most. Um, and we also need to make sure that there are pathways, not just for general reskilling, but targeted towards the sectors in which there is high demand for talent um, and that there are high paying jobs available. So the science, technology, engineering and math STEM sectors are a great opportunity area where women tend to be underrepresented, as well as the skilled trades. Um, so last week we saw an announcement, just as an example from the provincial government, uh, a new reskilling program focused on women and indigenous workers to enter trades in the nuclear industry. Uh, they also coupled it with childcare subsidies to make sure that women can actually participate. So that's um, the fantastic kind of step that we're looking for. Uh, and there are lots of great programs that we kind of summarize in the report, uh, stretching all the way from elementary school to mid-career training that are helping to address the gender imbalance within the workforce. So the programs that have worked and that have good outcomes, those are the ones we need to double down on and keep investing in because there's good evidence that some of these are really moving the dial. The fourth area is entrepreneurship. Um, and generally entrepreneurship is going to be a very big driver of economic recovery. Uh, but given the challenges I alluded to briefly for women entrepreneurs, we really need to make sure that they are able to grow and start their small businesses within Ontario. Um, and that means support with financing, but also things like legal advice, digital literacy, mentorship, and the other supports that really help businesses thrive. So our report provides a series of examples of the kinds of organizations that are working to support women entrepreneurs. If anyone here today is a woman entrepreneur and you wanna know what's available to you, um, that report might be a good place to start, um, but there are definitely others that I haven't included in there. Um, on the issue of accessing capital, we recently report, released another report called Capital is Key, which focuses on the financing challenges for diverse entrepreneurs as well. Um, so there are some solutions there specifically around uh, loan guarantees, tax incentives, um, and other forms of support for uh, entrepreneurs. Um, and then flexible work. So this is, you know, the final and uh, last but not least bucket. Uh, it can include everything from flexible hours to four day work weeks, job sharing arrangements, and a variety of other solutions. Uh, there's good evidence again, showing that these policies can not only level the playing field for women, but also increase productivity and satisfaction for all employees. Um, you know, the pandemic has kind of been an experiment with working from home for a lot of uh, employers. Uh, and it's up to employers to decide whether it's something that they implement long-term. But um, 
it, it can be uh, something that government encourages or incentivizes with the right kind of guidance. And that's especially important for uh, jobs that are not office based because there are solutions there around flexible work like job sharing, um, but it can be trickier from a logistical perspective. So it's important to provide that kind of training to employers. Um, and there's one study I really like here from Microsoft in Japan that shows that when they implemented a four day work week, they saw their sales increase by 40%. So this cannot just be framed as a solution for women. It's actually better for most businesses if done correctly. So that's all for my quick overview. Um, thank you so much for listening. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions if there's a few minutes now um, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Claudia. That was a really great overview. I, I I do have one question I want to ask um, and definitely want to hear from other folks. If you have questions, please put them in the chat and we'll make sure we bring them up. And I see some hands going up too. Um, but to get us started, I want to know how your report was received when it was shared. I, I mean, we saw it here at Wing Council. Um, I've seen it a few other places. You mentioned when it was launched in September. How was that received? And can you give us any guidance on our work to come here in our region based on the reception of this report and your recommendation? Yeah, great question. It was uh, very well received um, to put it shortly. I was surprised um, at the reception from the business community because for a long time, uh, these issues have been considered social issues and uh, not something that the Chamber of Commerce would wade into. But our, our members in particular were um, extremely receptive to the idea that they have a role as well in their internal policies uh, HR departments are doing some good work, but from the leadership position down, they need to be thinking about supporting women in the workforce. And I think that's partly because they saw firsthand um, over Zoom the personal lives of their workers and understand kind of a little bit better uh, how that's impacting their staff at work. So you often will hear a baby crying or a dog coming onto the screen and it you know, personalizes uh, the, the work experience. So from the business community, the response has been great. Um, from government as well, uh, although um, we are still eager to see that translated into action. So I think in terms of your second part of the question, um, we need to keep beating the drum because the reception was good, but we, we have a window of opportunity here during the pandemic to actually get policies implemented. Um, and things like supplier diversity within the procurement system, is, it's an easy win. Uh, if, if government were to move forward with just a supplier diversity program, they don't have to transform their whole procurement policy. They just have to create a stream. Um, and if we don't see action on that now, I'm afraid it it may be a lost opportunity. So as much people can be singing the same song, I think that's where we get real change. Great, that's one of the, another one of the reasons we wanted to have you come and share this with us so we can uh, put our Niagara stamp on this and work together moving forward, thank you. So I'm seeing a couple of comments in the chat. This was exceptional um, and a question, has GNCC been invited to the sheet recovery committee led by Minister Jill Dunlop? I'm going to look to Mishka as well to help answer that question. Um, actually, how, thank you very much actually for the question. It's a great, uh, great question. <clears throat> We've been asked actually to submit some uh, recommendations and suggestions to the committee. And that's how we have been asked uh, to be at the table. And we are preparing some of them and have already started some of the communication too. Great. And that's Another wonderful reason why it's good to have you and all of you here today with us to help inform that submission. Thank you to Paula Girardi for that question. Uh, so Claudia, we have another one in the chat from Michelle. She says, I love the impact this can possibly make for women entrepreneurs in Niagara. However, I saw nothing regarding agricultural, horticultural, or forestry and wildlife. Can you comment on that for us? Yeah, um, we have not taken a deep dive into that specific sector, um, and it's something I'll make a note of because we're always looking for new particular areas to look closer at. Um, I do know that from just my memory on the uh, industry breakdown of, of the gender representation, it tends to be quite low in the natural resource sectors. Uh, in agriculture, we, we did release a report recently on supporting um, the food supply chain. Uh, I see a hand up from Elizabeth Zimmerman from the YWCA in her lovely new office at the beautiful new building over on Oakdale Avenue. Elizabeth, you want to ask a question? Um, yes, I do. I just uh, wanted to see if there was any consideration given 
to, um, you know, if we are going to encourage women to go into STEM or into uh, skilled trades, how are we going to support them to ensure that they're in positive work environments? We already see the research showing that women do go into these um, into these sectors, but don't remain because uh, you know they can it, they can be really hostile environments that they face a lot of harassment and um, many other issues that uh, make it really difficult for them to continue to work. So has there been any consideration in terms of the recovery, how we support women in that respect? Yeah, great question. Um, it's sort of a chicken and egg problem because you can encourage women to enter the field, but then um, they, there aren't enough women there to create the culture that enables them to stay, then they leave. And then again, there's underrepresentation. And I can't tell you how many women I spoke to who had been in a career in engineering um, or in skill trades and they left because uh, the environment was just not conducive to, to them thriving there. Um, so what we've tried to do in the report is really reflect the need for support along the career uh, pathway um, and in conversations with government specifically, I've emphasized the need for mid-career supports because um, they're very keen on getting more girls interested in those types of jobs, but I've really tried to emphasize to them and through the report that that's um, only one part of the solution and can be counterproductive because then you're not fully um, addressing why women don't stay and enter those fields. Um, and a lot of these careers too, they, they are not um, family friendly. So if, if you have to leave work at five to pick up your child or before five, God forbid, um, they will schedule meetings at seven just to kind of create that environment where uh, you work hard and, and you show off how, how hard you can work. Um, and it, it's, uh, that's just an example, but there um, are some organizations that do co cohorts of women um, on in certain departments to um, create an internal support system. So that can be a, a short-term solution, um, but it is kind of a cycle of underrepresentation. Thank you for the question. It's a really good question. And I, th I think some really good points for us to think about when we get to thinking about solutions and some ideas that maybe we as a collective and as Wind Council will think about what we can do too. This is, this is exactly what we wanna to get to today. Are there any other questions for Claudia about her report? I do see another one in the chat here uh, from Chantel. Has there ever been any consideration to provide employer childcare subsidy to encourage more employers to follow suit? Subsidy is available for training. So I think maybe you can give us, uh, if you can give us some insight on that from your provincial uh, perspective, Claudia, and we're going to definitely talk about that from our Niagara perspective on what we can do. But what do you see in your in your research and preparing this report from the provincial level around childcare subsidies and what the provincial government's talking about now? So can I clarify, is this um, subsidy so that the employer can create childcare spaces, or is this... Uh, subsidies for parents looking for child care? No, subsidies for employers to provide child care services to their employees. A bit okay. like they're provided currently with training subsidies for all the you know, employee trainings they do. Yes, um, so this is something that the government tried, 20, the federal government tried it under the Harper administration and it was considered unsuccessful because the subsidy amount was so low that it wasn't enough to incentivize anything. Uh, and so they scrapped it and people consider it uh, a dead end. But um, I, I, don't, I don't think it is a dead end. I think it's a really great solution. The subsidy amount has to be high enough that it actually uh, makes a difference for employers. Um, and there are some employers, for example, Ontario Power Generation who partnered with us on the report that already offer childcare. So it's, um, also about leveraging the existing programs that are out there. Um, Ontario Power Generation has, for example, a childcare site at their main office. If there are other smaller employers in the region, they could partner with OPG, um, I think, to, to create that shared environment and shared space. Um, but on top of that, yeah, we've been pushing the federal and provincial governments to uh, jointly fund a subsidy to, um, to employers, and it has to be high enough to actually make a difference. So there was another comment in the chat and I'll just make, um, I'll just address that around childcare. Uh, we know that the federal government announced $30 billion fund in the federal budget. And so when that and how that money rolls out will now, as you mentioned, will be up to agreements between the federal government and the provincial government. 
and we haven't seen anything yet from our provincial government what they're going to um, what they're going to be considering. So this is another great opportunity for us to have these conversations locally so we can influence what those conversations will look like provincially and get solutions that really work for Niagara. So if you're interested in childcare, we do have a breakout room that's going to be specifically focused on this topic. And we'll dive into that a little bit deeper. Uh, Ruth Unra is going to be leading that breakout room and Ruth has been doing a ton of research on this topic and will be able to answer a lot more questions and get your input on that topic too. Julie, just uh, just for context, that so they they provided thirty billion commitment over the next five years and eight billion each year after that, um, and they've set targets on uh, fifty percent fee reduction uh, in aiming to reach ten dollars a day by twenty twenty six. So they've set the targets and the commitment amount, but they have not yet decided how to get there. Right. That's really great. Thank you. We'll make sure for anyone who's interested in childcare issue that we can get, uh, we'll send out some information in the chat, uh, links to that, links to those reports, links to the federal budget announcement and uh, more after this event. So I'm told there's one more question in the chat we're gonna take from Haley. There it is. Haley says your report was exceptional and I think we all agree this is really helpful for us. And at the end, you mentioned flexible work hours or redu reduced work hours. Can you tell me what the response has been, particularly with reduced work hours? It varies. Um, I think some employers are more receptive to it. Um, some are experimenting with it. I think anyone who's interested in exper or in implementing it should do a pilot program and see what happens. Um, there, you know, I'm a big fan of New Zealand's approach where they did it uh, as an incentive for employers um, during the summer to support local tourism businesses as well. So if people have a four day work week this summer, for example, they're gonna travel for the rest of the, the long weekend um, and that's good for the domestic tourism industry. So it can be a time limited thing. Um, response has been mixed. I mean, some people uh, are worried about what that will do and that's understandable as well. Um, and they, they just need to think about how it might work in their context. Um, I, I think that the important thing to note is that if we're talking about something like a four day work week, it shouldn't mean longer hours on the four days that you're working that defeats the whole purpose. So um, there's, it, it's not gonna work for everyone. It depends on what kind of job you do. Something for us to think about as well. Okay, I'm gonna take one more question because it's a great one from Coletta in our chat. She says, diversity, equity, and inclusion are noted regularly in the report. Our region has established a committee to address this. What are your thoughts with respect to DEI, so diversity, equity, and inclusion, and she recovery? Critical. Um, I think when we talk about women's economic recovery, we're uh, thinking about inclusive economic recovery more broadly, as the, the title of this event suggests. Um, and not all women have experienced the crisis the same way. So um, it it needs to be an intersectional approach that looks at um, how different types of women and, and different demographics are impacted, different regions as well. Um, and then the this, this inclusivity part of that DEI is really the key because um, the conversation so far has, I think, globally been limited to the diversity part. Uh, and that's the first step. But um, again, when you think about representation, Elizabeth's question earlier about getting more people to actually stay in the fields and thrive in the fields, it's about how inclusive the culture is. So um, yeah, I think we need to be thinking about it more broadly than just shoe recovery. Um, it, it's sometimes a sensitive subject when you start really digging into it and it's uncomfortable for a lot of people and that's uh, important. Uh, it's important to feel that discomfort and sit with it and deal with the challenges. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Claudia. This gives us a, a lot of different, a lot of different places to start thinking about actions and solutions that we're going to build from from here. I know there's a lot more activity going on in the chat, and I don't want to cut anyone off, but we do want to get to uh, those smaller breakout rooms to really engage in some of these issues some more. And we do also have a jam board, so that's like a virtual whiteboard where you can pin your ideas, and we can share those with each other as we go from here. So I just want to pause there to say thank you one more time for producing this really important report and giving us the opportunity to think about uh, what we can do locally with your, your research and all of the work that you've done at the Ontario Chamber so far. 
uh, to now take that to our local chamber. So I think Claudia is gonna be able to stick around for a little while longer. And we also have a, uh, another uh, speaker who I believe is here, Blake Landry from Niagara Region, who's gonna spend a few minutes giving us some Niagara specific data about uh, employment and recovery in Niagara. That'd be helpful not only to, to know what are some of the policy recommendations, but what does the data actually look like and where do we go from here? We know that the Niagara Workforce Planning Board has also done a series on gender equity and you receive some of that information before today's event. Uh, so hopefully everyone has that with them, can use that as a resource and we'll also hear from Blake now. So Blake is a um, researcher with Niagara Region Economic Development and he has been doing uh, business impact surveys for the last year or so to get an understanding of the uh, impacts of the pandemic across the region and then to use that information to go forward. So Blake, uh, we, we're hoping you're here with us. I'm, I don't see you yet. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> oh, great, great, thank you. Please give us some insight on women's employment in Niagara and what are the statistics looking like right now? Okay, I'm gonna share my screen one second, please. All right, um, so Claudia did an excellent job actually capturing um, um, the characteristics and the things that are really impacting women. And I would like to suggest that, uh, you know, the pandemic exacerbated the situation, but this has existed for, for many, many years and it's very apparent in the data. Um, so what I'm gonna show you is basically kind of an annual perspective on the data in terms of uh, women's uh, place in the workforce uh, and those statistical characteristics. Um, and then I'm gonna show you month over month during the pandemic what actually happened. Um, so when we look at the labor force, so these are uh, people who are working age population. So about 15 years to 64 years of age um, who participate in the labor force who are actually working or or looking actively looking for employment. So you can see here year over, uh, women have uh, um, been at a uh, you know a lesser uh, number than men. And then you can see in 2020 there is actually a notable uh, dive in terms of uh, women's labor force participation. So that means uh, many women actually left the labor force, choosing either not to work or not participate in the labor force for any of those number of issues that Claudia had addressed in her presentation. Um, so when we look at employment um, by sex, you can see in 2016 there was almost parity, uh, and then it, uh, it it got noticeably worse in, in terms of uh, 2020. So there was again a notable dive. Um, in women employment. And again, Claudia mentioned this as well. Um, women, particularly, uh, uh, so, you know, traditional occupations in accommodation, food service, retail, personal services, those took the biggest hit in the pandemic. So if anyone saw my uh, uh, survey or my presentation last week, just about the industries that are affected, um, it was predominantly industries that are uh, you know, predominantly run by kind of female employees and entrepreneurs. Um, so uh, that said, um, Niagara also has a location quotient in these sectors of about 1.7, meaning we have 1.7 times the amount of jobs uh, in these in this these sectors than um, Ontario does. So we can expect that Niagara women in particular were harder hit than Ontario. So this is an important uh, consideration because you know this is affecting uh, women across the country, Ontario, but it actually has a more in, intense effect on women in Niagara given our economic base. Um, so when we look at full-time employment by sex and then part-time, you can see that males kind of dominate in the full-time employment uh, statistics. You can see that females lost employment at a, uh, a, a greater amount than males from 2019 to 2020. Um, and then you see that females hold more part-time employment than males. So again, um, this... Uh, tells us again that uh, the accommodations or the industries and sectors that typically have more part-time employment would have been affected and women actually bore the brunt of um, that uh, part of the economic impact. 
Um, when we look at unemployment by sex, um, again, uh, everybody noticed an increase in unemployment um, during 2020, the, the year of the pandemic. Um, uh, and you can see here that both men and women felt uh, unemployment uh, uh, results of the pandemic. Um, unemployment rate, um, again, you can see the difference between males and females in 2020. Um, we were almost at parity around 2018 and then unemployment for women um, uh, actually dropped in 2020, which is actually was a good, th or 2019, sorry, which actually was a good thing. We were actually moving in the right direction in 2019, but then again, um, unemployment uh, uh, boosted for both men and women, but in particular, you see a higher kind of um, boost for unemployment uh, with women. Um, in terms of participation rates, so a participation rate uh, is the working age population who are actually participating in the labor force um, as a, a percentage. So you can see again, women are have dropped out of the labor force in 2020, are choosing not to participate. And again, this could be a likely a result of the pandemic, um, a loss of employment prospects and that sort of thing. So many would have decided to uh, like leave the labor force and not participate. And that was a greater rate than men in 2020. Um, and then in employment rate, again, um, women saw a steeper decline in 2020 in terms of the actual employment rate uh, percentage compared to men. So now I'm just gonna show you the monthly stats. So you can see here, um, this is month over month from January, 2020 to May 21. You can see wherever we've had uh, like a, a shutdown or a stay at home order disproportionately felt by women in the labor force. So whenever we had one of those stay at home orders, women left the labor force, which uh, like at a greater rate than men, um, which is not a positive sign again, I think it's reflective of the key sectors where we see a lot of um, occupations dominated by women. Um, employment by sex. Um, so again, where you see the, the uh, shutdowns or the stay at home orders, women are disproportionately affected compared to men. However, we do see leading up to May 2021, a little bit of a recovery there. So hopefully that continues um, at a positive trajectory. I believe when the economy opens up um, in our business survey, businesses are saying they're gonna need more people than they had pre-pandemic. So hopefully this helps increase some of the employment levels um, of women in Niagara. Um, then again, when we look at month over month, full-time versus part-time, um, fewer full-time uh, women um, in employment, more part-time. And you can see the difference in terms of how full-time and part-time are affected by the things like stay-at-home orders and shutdowns. Um, you see uh, it's, it's directly reflected in these particular graphs. Um, unemployment by sex, again, monthly, um, you see a high unemployment in May, June, July, 2020. That's at the uh, kind of the height of the pandemic um, in terms of all of the uh, different regulations, workforce, force, re workplace regulations coming into play. Um, and then you saw this, um, some recovery around September, October as things were opening up more. Um, but then again, with the shutdowns and the different uh, measures um, early in 2021, um, you see higher unemployment. Um, we see a bit of a return now back to um, lower unemployment, but again, um, that really depends on the course of the pandemic um, and the different economic reopening uh, measures. I think women will benefit the most in terms of economic reopening, because ultimately it's the occupations that they dominate that are mostly affected in the pandemic. And then unemployment rate percent uh, by sex, again, month over month, um, you can see those dynamics um, May 2020 um, unemployment rate basically uh, was quite high uh, for both men uh, and women, men more than women, but then it kind of shifts to women. Um, so there's some different dynamics happening here. Unfortunately, we can't get the sectoral data by sex, so we can't actually see 
exactly what sectors uh, and then what sex in each sector are being affected. Um, this is basically the level of detail that we have. So there is a challenge in that there is very little sex-based data for us to do this analysis. I chose the labor force survey to do this just because it is the only one that really separates the different sexes in the labor force. Um, but it only gives us a high level perspective. There is a data challenge uh, in terms of doing this analysis. Um, when we look at the participation rate again, so these are the people uh, of working age who are actually participating in the labor force. And again, women lag men um, throughout the course of the pandemic. And again, we can see around the stared home orders or the shutdowns, it disproportionately affecting women's uh, ability to participate in the labor force. Um, and the employment rate, so this is uh, um, the rate of the labor force who's actually employed during the pandemic. Again, women like men throughout the months of the pandemic. Um, you can see uh, how this is uh, affected by, again, the stay at home orders, the shutdowns, that sort of thing. Um, and that's it in terms of just uh, the uh, details. Um, we did ask some questions in our last survey about women-owned entrepreneurship, and I was crunching those numbers, but it was really difficult for me to find certain trends in the data to present. Um, so I really chose to look at the labor force survey data um, because it is very apparent in that data how women are affected uh, in regards to employment, their ability to participate in the labor force, um, and those characteristics. So uh, um, to, to leave you with anything, um, I believe Niagara women were affected probably more intensely than that of uh, Ontario, just given the concentration of you know, women dominated sectors and occupations in Niagara. So I believe that Niagara should have more programs and resources um, to better work with women to, to you know, to better um, participate in the labor force to better find employment opportunities to support women entrepreneurs. Um, I definitely believe it's necessary because it's very apparent in the data that there's some inequity happening. Um, so this data can be used to kind of, um, you know, support advocacy in terms of programs and resources to, to correct that. Well, thank you, Blake, because that's exactly what we want to hear. And that's exactly what we're getting together uh, to help you with. Uh, getting Sorry. ideas and solutions that we can work together with you, with Niagara Region Economic Development, with the business community, with our partners to get women back to work. And I, I wrote down um, a whole lot of things that you said, because the data is one thing, the numbers are one thing, but what you've just said verifies, you know, all of the feelings that we're having and also um, that it's been a long time coming, many years, notable dive, a lot of important words and language that um, shape that data. So thank you for sharing that. We will uh, definitely be looking for opportunities to work together with Niagara Region Economic Development uh, on any of those solutions and programs. And we'll get back to you after our hackathon today with what we can do together. Now I think Blake might be frozen or he's got a really good poker face. Okay, that's great. So that's enough talking at you, I think folks. We really want to get you involved in this conversation and where we go from here. So now we're gonna break out into uh, breakout rooms that there, there are four, not five, but they are based on the themes of the uh, OCC strategy. So you, when you signed up, you would have picked a topic that you wanna talk about some more, leadership and accountability, uh, safe and affordable childcare. We've put together workforce development and flexible work just to manage the numbers and entrepreneurship. So shortly after, after this, and we've already done a test run of this, we're going to send you into some breakout rooms and we really want to hear from you and get those ideas, uh, get them on the virtual whiteboard, get them in the chat and uh, help us get, uh, get moving with action. Now I wanna say that this doesn't, your ideas don't need to be fully developed. They don't need to be flushed out. It can be a little nugget of wisdom and we, we really want you to not be shy to speak up, take yourself off mute, turn your cameras on and participate because this is just the start and we wanna get all ideas on the table as we go from here to develop our plan. And there's Blake. Uh, thanks Blake, we really appreciate uh, you sharing some of that uh, important data with us. Okay, everyone, we're, since we've already done our dress- Thank you, I had an- 
So I just mentioned I had an internet disruption, which is I got cut off before, but thank you everyone for having me. Thank you, Blake. We appreciate it. It's good context. And now we're going to jump into our breakout rooms and then we're going to come back here and I can't wait to hear uh, what, what the ideas, what the options, what the solutions are in all of your minds today so we can get started and work together. So we'll see you again in a little while. Thanks for returning. I hope you had a great session so far. That, that went so fast. Sorry. <laughs> so fast. So we wanted to save some time because we know that um, there'll still be lots of, hopefully lots more ideas uh, that are generating in your mind, not only after that quick uh, session together, but by sharing what we heard in our different breakout rooms now. Maybe you'll go forward and think about some other ideas and things that we can build on and work together. So next, I'm going to ask all of the facilitators from the different rooms to share maybe top two, three ideas that you came up with that we can continue to build on from here. So I'm going to start with uh, Leslie Calvin, leadership and accountability. And I just came from this room and I know we, we got cut off at the end there, but some great ideas that were starting to be generated. We did. Um, so there was some amazing conversation in our room. Um, we were going to do a bit at the end to uh, do a summary of it. So I'm, I'm going to speak on behalf of the room. I hope I capture what um, you also see as some of the key areas. One of the common themes from a leadership and accountability perspective um, really also goes back to um, what was mentioned at the top of the call about it needs to be measured. Um, so that uh, was one of it. But another real strong theme was all around support, supporting um, inclusivity and diversity with conversations, supporting female, um, female um, women or uh, females going into uh, politics, supporting uh, people to move up, um, supporting each other across sectors. So if you have uh, different organizations uh, or businesses that have uh, DEI um, uh, uh, committee, are you working with with other companies and corporations across so that um, so that it carries above? And I think Cheryl just sent me. Um, whole big oh, laundry list. You did look at that. That's a big one. Um, yeah. So I think um, um, anti-harassment and discrimination policies also was talked about, and obviously that well, we could have hatched that egg and talked um, quite a lot more in terms of uh, women in politics um, in the Niagara region. So I I hope that um, I hope that I caught the the main ones that we we talked about. Yeah, for sure, Leslie, and I'll just add. Um, because I was kind of watching. So um, a lot of passion around that collaborative piece and the support yeah. piece, like who's doing it right? How do we open better conversations um, and, and get some legislation and, and mandates for whether it's for pay equity, um, whether it's for harassment and discrimination, like get some policies and things in place too, um, to force some issues. Thanks, Cheryl. Thanks to the group. So is there anyone else who's here who has something specific to leadership and accountability? Claudia gave us a few ideas about some actions that they've outlined uh, provincially. Is there anything specific to our region on um, this theme of leadership and accountability that you're, you've got a really burning thought in your mind and you want to make sure we get noted now? Whether you want to raise your hand or put it in the chat or on the Jamboard. Okay, I, sh I see Michelle. Go ahead, Michelle. Thank you. Um, yeah, as far as leadership, um, we have so many amazing um, female owned and operated and run businesses in Niagara. Um, and and I've, I have been one for many years throughout the Niagara region, um, but our representation at local government level um, has been almost non-existent unless you were already well known and already um, established in like St. Catharines or you were on um, some sort of uh, government position or board of something in Niagara whereas um, as a small business owner in at the time I was in Pelham 
um, it, a bunch of us got together because in the field of my choosing, I'm, I'm an equestrian professional by trade and education. Um, the equestrian industry in Niagara is 99% female. And we were not taken seriously. We were turned away at every level for many things. And as soon as a, a man came in, and I'm not trying to be sexist or whatever, feminist, but the men had the representation. They could walk in as a man and go, well, this is what I want to see changed in the bylaws of Pelham. And, and they would be taken seriously. And it didn't matter that my neighbor who had the farm beside me was a well-known lawyer who came with me and two other people. It was just like, oh yeah, it's the horse ladies. And oh, we're out of time. And oh, we will look into it, but nothing would ever get done. And I would like to see stronger government representation for female uh, entrepreneurs and business owners at our local re government level. So one thing I'll say to that is we have elections coming up in the next year and a bit. There will be provincial elections. There will be local elections. That means city and region in Niagara. So a whole lot of positions available for the taking. It would be really great to see a lot more diversity on those ballots. And since we have such a diverse group of folks here today who are obviously interested in this topic, I think we should put it out there to say if anyone's interested or know someone who's interested, even just starting with this group, you have a network of folks who are here and interested to support and be a resource and, and help make uh, some change on that topic and get Thank more you. diversity at, uh, in our political representation. I think that uh, some we've made some good progress and have some uh, good foundations in Niagara, but definitely haven't, uh, haven't crossed the finish line in terms of getting that seat at the table yet. And I know there's some uh, elected officials on the call too. So again, if that's something you're interested in or know someone who is, reach us out to us at WIN and we will do what we can to help you out. That's great. Anything else on leadership or accountability, this theme before we move on to another? And again, please feel free if ideas, actions, things we can do continue to come to you after this, we're gonna keep going and uh, the Jamboard will be open and you can always reach us on social media. Okay, I see Claude Dean's hand up too. Oh, you're muted. We don't hear you, Claudine. Thanks. There we go. <laughs> I Everybody has that t-shirt, right? Chat, um, Ruma, I don't know how Ontario's Regional Relief and Recovery Fund is working um, or how, how it was used, if it's going to be extended, that kind of thing. But what I do think is it would be great if a portion of those dollars were dedicated to women-run businesses. Um, and I, I don't believe that happened when I went to the website, it certainly didn't identify women run businesses. Uh, but I do think on a go forward basis, that would be an exceptional, a really good idea. That is a great idea. Thank you, Coletta. Sorry, Sorry, Claudine. I think we got Coletta and Claudine. But that's oh, good. Idea. We'll make sure we get that noted, Coletta. Thank you. So dedicated portion of recovery fund to women owned businesses. I think that's exactly it. Okay, Claudine, and then Leslie, will come to you next. Um, one thing that kind of came to mind, and as I was going through the report, um, the idea was spurred around the uh, gender equality leadership in the Canadian private sector um, comment where there's the blueprint and assessment tool. Um, the assessment tool itself um, was an interesting kind of concept to me. So there may be cases where there is a blatant um, you know, disregard or ignoring of the issues. Um, in a lot of cases, there's just a lack of awareness. And I wonder if the assessment tool, thinking about this across all of the um, five topics that we were looking at today, just might help um, employers stare down uh, or look in the mirror a little bit more critically um, and see themselves if, you know, if it's constructed in the, in the right way. So just wanted to offer that as a, you know, a possible um, support to, to some of the change that we're looking to bring. Great, 
Thank you. Okay, last note on this topic, Leslie Harper. Hi, um, I put a lot, I've put a lot of thought in this. I used to be involved in politics and this is a suggestion for when, maybe if it was advertised broadly for women to come to a campaign workshop, how it works, what it's about. I sat on a women's task force years ago and what the challenges were for women running for political office and then maybe have a lobby workshop a lot of people don't know how to lobby properly because i don't know about you guys but i'm really tired of just being a little pat on the head or we'll have diversity and inclusion but really you don't have a voice you're just sort of there to either rubber stamp or just be there because that's the right thing to do. So I'd like to see, it's just a suggestion for when to have either a campaign, a camp, well, both actually a campaign workshop and a lobbying workshop so that we can truly have a voice that will require more than just the pat on the head or we'll table till the next meeting kind of thing. Those are some really actionable suggestions. Thank you, Leslie. Okay. That education theme, right? Definitely. On multiple levels. So thank you to our scribes and Cheryl Matthews from Wing Council for getting all these ideas down. And again, folks, remember we have the Jamboard too. Okay, so next topic is childcare. Uh, Ruth and Grace from the breakout room. Please tell us what you've got. Okay, well, first of all, thanks to everybody who participated and uh, brought your ideas. Um, we sort of spent a little time reviewing where we've been with childcare because a lot has happened in the last few months, especially in Niagara. But the bottom line is we all agree that we want everybody in Niagara to have access to uh, quality and affordable childcare. And um, we spent a little bit of time actually talking about the fact that we've got a lot of women that seem to be working part time. We don't have the disaggregated data necessarily that lets us know whether those women that are working part time are choosing to work part time or, and I know Thalia, I can see Thalia nodding her head and maybe she can um, speak to this too, but um, are they choosing to work part-time because that's what they want? Or are they working part-time because they're having trouble accessing childcare or even elder parent care? So that's sort of an issue. But if we could move people through safe, affordable, quality childcare from part-time to full-time, there would be a lot, of, um, a lot of things addressed with that. Some of the ideas that that came out of this was, um, and I love this. I mean, I think that uh, we have an opportunity here to make Niagara a showcase in um, in what we can do with childcare. I think that we've got um, the Economic um, Development and Planning Committee are listening. Niagara Region's listening. Um, we understand that it's an economic issue as well as a social issue. So. Um, so one of the things that, that we talked about is building down on the school platform. So in other words, you know, if we start lowering that age, you remember we went from five to four in terms of starting full-time school. If we start lowering that age, that not only solves some of the issues for parents um, and what to do with their children, but it also takes a look at professionalizing that ECE a little bit more and ensuring that those people are getting paid appropriately because that's another one of those issues that we've got ECEs that are making really crap money. Um, it's not a living wage. They're going to school for two years and they're coming out and making next to nothing unless you're working for a regional run daycare, which is sort of another idea too, is that we could expand on that regional daycare. Um, and I think, um, you know, we can, we, can, we can lend voice to that, certainly. Um, and we also talked about the great model that was um, talked about by Claudia in with the Ontario Power um, Generation and including other small businesses in that. If we can get large businesses to look at childcare and, and how we could include small businesses in that. Um, and, you know, is there subsidization available? Is there government money for that? We don't necessarily know how the feds all that money is going to uh, happen. The province is going to go to the feds to negotiate that, but there might be money available there. Um, and when we talk about increasing the salaries for ECEs, we're also very clear that that cost should not be transferred to families. So again, you know, keep on pushing for the, um, the fully funded childcare as opposed to the tax credit model 
which what is what seems to be popular with this current government. So, um, so those are kind of the things that we captured. Grace, is there anything there that I'm missing? Um, no, just, um, well, one of the tricky things was the flexible, um, flexible childcare in terms of our region and specifically, uh, you know, hospitality workers don't necessarily require childcare from nine to five um, and trying to expand that model. So we started to discuss it, but it is a very tricky, tricky issue to try to come up with solutions with in, in a shorter time. So this is one area definitely we'll have to pay some more attention to in the future as well. Thank you both. Anyone have a, a, a burning idea about childcare, a solution, an opportunity? There, I will tell you, and I don't know if Daryl's still on the call or anyone else from the region, but there is a report, I think it's going right now actually, to uh, regional council about childcare. So this conversation is on the agenda literally today. So something that we should all pay attention to and look for opportunities to continue to collaborate and talk about and speak up. Haley, really quickly on childcare. I know you're a childcare provider. Oh, really quickly, Julie, the pressure's on. I have so much to talk about. Um, am I on? My mic on? Okay. You're on, go ahead. Um, thank you for, um, first, I, I did a, a town hall briefly um, with, uh, and the GNCC participated. Thank you so much, Miska. It was really uh, informative for me, but I think what always happens with, um, my children are ages three, three and five. And in the last few years, I've noticed that the programs that they have, um, including childcare, there's, it seems to me there's zero marketing around it. And then they don't get used and then they get sliced. Um, and I think it's really, really important that everything we do, like marketing, you know, can convince you of every, anything or nothing. So it's really, really important that when we're, we're building um, and we're rallying around these, these, these any item really, but especially support services for families and childcare is probably the biggest um, that we market it and and how you know there's opportunities for women to do what I did to leave their job and stay home and and do a home childcare. It may not be for everybody, but um, you know there there's lots of options out there. So I'm um, such a great. Um, topic so one I'm so glad that Wynn continuously <laughs> brings up and continuously posting about but um yeah anyways I, I could go on but I'll stop so thank you thank you we'll we'll make sure we circle back with you Haley when we come back to this topic and flesh out some of these ideas for sure lots of work to do on child care we'll make sure that everyone who's interested also has access to any of the reports or actions again that come from today's meeting Okay, so the next topic we spoke about was workforce development, and we combined that with flexible work with uh, Melanie and Isabella leading that session. Can you tell us what you heard? What are the ideas? Yes, we have a double task of um, tackling two of them, but they were great because again, they all intertwine, right? And I'm hearing a lot of similarities from the leadership one as well. So workforce development, and flexible work were two of the ones that we tackled. There were three distinctive um, themes that came out and Josie and Isabella from Wind Council were there um, with me too, that everybody participated in, and contributed to. So one was really continuing to uh, develop the policies, continue to lobby the government for, you know, to, to really take action to support this. So that's just one thing that needs to keep happening. The second thing was advocacy and sponsorship really the timing of these conversations right now to keep them fresh, to keep them relevant, because timing really is of the essence. Right now, we have this fresh data. We are, you know, really encouraged. We're motivated. Um, there, it feels like there is a bit of a, a time's up or a time limit on this before we go back um, to the, our old ways. And really, it would be really difficult to go backwards and have these conversations. There's a great podcast with Brene Brown and Priya Parker, and they talk about, you know, working from home and they really talked about equity and acceptance accessibility and just asking these questions. So just not going back to normal, but really asking what did we learn? What can we implement? And I think those are huge. The third idea here was how to support employers. So really creating that how-to kit, that resource in terms of here's something that can help you um, talk about policy. Here's something that can give you um, resources, conversations, really that common language for people to adopt and to continuously use so that you know, it really reduces the friction and the stigma and all that, that other stuff that goes with these uh, conversations too. I know that Rachel is going to put up some information on possibility models as well. So um, yeah, some really amazing discussion in this group. Uh, 
I don't know, Josie, Isabella, did I miss anything? Did you want to add? Or anybody from my group? I was just going through the notes as you were talking, making sure that we hit on all the top points. So great job, Melanie. We're good. Okay, wonderful. Great job to this group. Thanks. Thank you. Um, one thought I had there is I want to ask if there's anyone who's on this call or anyone who knows someone whose workplace has a flexible work policy, again, to the point, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Is there, do you know of a workplace somewhere in Niagara or maybe further afield that we can take a look at their policies, see what works and, and come up with some ideas for broader for the region? I see Lisa's hand up on that, but you're muted. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Um, so just on a smaller scale, so I currently have a, a team of six people who are working for me. A couple of years ago, I decided to give it a shot and just change the hour. So I'm a insurance financial services typical. Most businesses are maybe eight to 6pm sort of sort of thing in my industry. And I was just finding that the people I had working with me at that time two um, two women with young children. And it seemed that maybe we could try something. And so I did, and I switched it. So our hours are 9.30 to 4.30, Monday to Friday, which didn't take too much off. And I, I chose because I had a small team not to really, re I didn't reduce their wages. So they ended up making more per hour, but working less time. And the feedback I immediately got was, I can't believe that I can come in at 9.30 and I can leave at 4.30, so I don't rush to get my kids to school. And at the end of the day, they're only in care for such a small amount of time. So the payback for me was huge, just making that small change. And then as my team um, uh, increased, it didn't seem to make any difference depending on who I had there. And now the pandemic, of course, has completely changed all of that. And I've had to do the remote thing and, and um, it hasn't been easy, but I loved when we were speaking earlier about the idea that, you know, just, just trying it and seeing how there are ways that you can be flexible, depending on your situation and who you have working for you, how can you make it work? And really, uh, I get a lot of weird looks from, from my colleagues, like, how do you do that? I do it. And I'm still really successful. We didn't lose business, nothing dropped off and my employees are happier. So, so you can definitely try these things. You just have to be brave enough uh, to give it a shot and see. And also know, I think that you don't have to commit to something permanently. I love the idea of just try, just try. It and I love that Lisa, because it's exactly the theme. And I'm so glad that you're talking about this because it's about experimentation. I believe it was Claudine who had brought, uh, brought that up too. It's like experiment, call it a pilot, give people permission. That's yep. beautifully said. Thank you. Okay, I see Amanda's hand came up next as well. On this uh, mine's a little bit off topic. It's more so on the workforce development. So I don't know if you want the other examples of um, the flex schedules to go first. Go ahead. We're gonna run. We're gonna run short on time. So please go ahead. And if okay. anyone has policies, ideas, throw them in the chat or put them in the Jamboard, please. Perfect. Um, so I come from um, employment agency background, so I have a lot to say around workforce development. I'm going to condense them as much as possible. So um, in my experience, the first thing uh, that I wanted to touch on was mentorship. So not just the traditional forms of mentorship, but um, having business really engage with um, the educational institutions that are already in place in Niagara, um, the employment agencies. We have a really strong employment agency network here in Niagara. Um, so working with uh, those other stakeholders to um, create opportunities for our, our, um, our community to connect and uh, get, it, get attached to different networks, um, learn employability skills, learn those soft skills, um, I think is, is integral. Um, the other thing is we've all heard micro-credential training. That's a huge thing right now. Um, so I think looking at more of those and um, applying them with a holistic approach. So Claudia did mention um, that a lot of those programs are now including daycare as part of the options. Um, it actually even take that a step further, but look at the entire situation. So what else does a working parent need in order to be successful when they're upgrading their skill sets? And those micro-credential programs are key because um, for any, a, a very simple example would be someone making $15 an hour as a receptionist. If you can get them some concentrated training to learn accounting or bookkeeping, that automatically shoots their wage right up and makes them more employable. Um, and the same thing with the trades. Like if um, There's so many announcements going around uh, as far as uh, different trade programs. Um, some of them do have pushes to get different populations more engaged. Um, so that's part of it as well, is really um, engaging 
you know, women, um, uh, different backgrounds and ethnicities and things like that to get more involved in those programs so that they can get trained. Um, and I think a key piece to that is actually starting young. It's actually getting the parents or the guardians on board that, um, like, especially those trades, we hear it all the time that, that uh, these parents and, and guardians have misconceptions on what happens in that trade and what's going to happen to, you know, their, their child when they, they go off in those directions. So making sure that uh, we have kind of a holistic approach to that. Really good. Thanks, Amanda. Micro credentials is a very big buzzword right now. So we got to make sure we take advantage of opportunities to work with the post-secondary education uh, institutions in Niagara. We've got two and more. So that's a great idea. Thank you. Okay, folks, we can keep the ideas coming in the chat and the jam board. But for now, I'm going to move on to the last of our breakout topics, which was entrepreneurship. Uh, so that's Nora and Marcia. What did you hear? We had some great discussion. Um, so I'm, I'm going to try to, to get it down to the three, three points to bring. Uh, so one of them was kind of a combination that we saw through a lot of points, which was lack of support for those solar solopreneurs. So in either your, your, your self-employed, your service business, you're a solopreneur. Um, and so grant programs, startup uh, grants, operating grants, and even access to things like Canada, Ontario job uh, grants aren't accessible if you're in that situation. So the solution would be things that are available to entrepreneurs and small businesses being available also to self-employed solopreneurs. Uh, and the next point was uh, people on disability uh, payments, our disability program are really penalized for trying to uh, have their own businesses. So having um, some way to not have such um, aggressive clawbacks. Um, so they're, you know, to incentivize uh, having your own business at the same time. Uh, and then centralized resources. So there's so much out there, but it's so hard to find it. If there was a master checklist of what to do when you're starting your business and resources um, that are, you know, organized because it's very hard uh, for people to find it. Um, Marcy, is there anything else that? No, I think that's great. It, it's interesting to note how similar um, the she recovery report was to the discussion we had in our breakout room and how it was really sort of on point with um, the local experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it was great. And thanks everyone for participating. It was a good discussion. Thank you. Is there anyone else on this topic of entrepreneurship, solopreneurship? Those are some really um, bite-sized actions that I think we can think about taking on both as WIN and maybe with some uh, partners as well in terms of information and centralized resources checklists. Ruth, go ahead. I think that it's really, um, and, I, and I think Claudia mentioned this at the beginning, you know, if we were to draw a Venn diagram, I, I love a good Venn diagram of these, of these topics, there would be overlap, right? Um, you know, we're talking about entrepreneurship and we're talking about a lack of childcare space, space and we're talking about leadership and we're talking about all of these things and it's, you know, childcare can be entrepreneurial as well and there can be subsidization for entrepreneurial people, you know, going into childcare and there's just so many areas that we can overlap this that that I think that another interesting hackathon would be to bring all of these things together. And um, I know Karina is probably like, what? Um, another event, but you know, to, to bring them all together and look at how they intersect. Absolutely. All of these ideas are definitely interconnected and that's a great example. Uh, and so where we wanna go from here, I think that's a natural pivot point for uh, uh, some concluding remarks and next steps is to take the ideas that we heard today, the feedback that we heard from you today, and we're going to, uh, Swing Council, we're gonna continue to digest and think about what we specifically can do, but also what we can do as a resource and as a collaborator with other women's groups in the region, with other uh, entrepreneurial organizations and through the chamber, what can we do to develop some of these ideas and opportunities a little bit further? And we will take all these nuggets and we will flush them out and we will share them back with you. And not only with you, but with the broader community to share 
the feedback that we're hearing from women in Niagara and through our our channels and our collaborations and partnerships to develop some actions from these ideas that we can do to get women back to work and an equitable recovery in Niagara. So this was quick and this was dirty, but it's a really good starting point to figure out where we wanna go from here and who we can work with from here on some of these action items. We really wanna get from talk to action. So this is just a starting point today. I wanna to, again, as I've said it many times during this chat, encourage you that if you have more ideas, if you go and, and talk with someone about this chat that you saw today, or if you read the OCC She Covery report again, or something comes to mind, we're gonna keep that Jamboard open for at least the next few days and continue to populate it with ideas. Again, they can be like this big or this big, and we'll continue to go from there. And we will commit to sharing that back with you, reporting back to you and sharing that more broadly. So when you do start to see some of these ideas come out from Wind Council, whether it's on social media or you hear Ruth on the radio as she regularly does and some of our other members, we have other events like this. We hope that you will help us amplify the message and invite people to participate in those programs or, or the mentorship or get involved in politics. As we go forward from here, know that you were a part of building some ideas and solutions and continue to get involved with us. And if you're interested, as we go forward and plan from here, uh, please know that there's always lots of ways to get involved with WIN and you can reach out to any of our members here. I'm gonna ask everyone who's on our WIN Council, who's on the chat to raise their hand and wave now. Those are the facilitators from today and others. So you can find us on social media, you can chat with us and you will see a formal uh, follow-up from this event today, in addition to the gym board. So on that note, we're gonna wrap it up. And again, Final, uh, final call for me to say, this is not the end, this is just the beginning. So please continue to share and dialogue and connect with us. And we look forward to working with you as we go forward and build back better in Niagara. Thank you for making time today. I know everyone gets zoomed out and your days are very busy and we really appreciate the opportunity to connect with all of you. It's been great. Thanks, Julie. Thanks everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you everyone. Hey, bye. Good comments. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Bye. -bye.